Welcome to lecture 5C, where our topic of discussion is on network on chip router microarchitecture. We already had an understanding about what is styled chip multicore processors and what is the role that the routers are playing in this network on chip for effective communication when from one part of the chip to another. We have already learned about what are the routing techniques, what are the various topologies that we are using. The next major component in the study of network on chip router is to understand the internal architecture of NOC routers. That is what is known as router microarchitecture. The router itself consists of various components wherein we store the packets. We try to do some internal operations on it such that the packets can be moved to the adjacent router. Some kind of flow control mechanism is required and some kind of handshaking is also required between the adjacent routers to facilitate the smooth movement of the packets. So, in today's lecture, we will have a detailed understanding about what is the router micro architecture of an NOC router. How are you going to handle contention when two packets are reaching a same router and two packets, one coming from the north and the other coming from the south, both wanted to go in the same west direction. So, when two packets trying to use the same link at the same time, what we can do? One approach is since we use buffers inside the routers, we will buffer one of them and permit the other one to take the output channel or we can drop one of the packet or we can misroute one packet. So, these are the three different strategies that are used in order to handle contention. So, contention is a scenario where multiple packets are looking for same output port. Since the bandwidth is limited, only one packet can go through that uh, desired output port. The other packet we have to handle, three approaches, one is buffering, second one is dropping and the third one is deflecting. Buffering is keeping that packet, retaining the packet for the next cycle and try its chance in the next cycle. Then uh, the second approach of dropping means we have to again re start these packets activities back from its source. The third one is trying to reroute it through some other port. We will try to understand what is the concept of flow control. So, we are going to discuss about network on chip which are using the buffering concept. So, packets will be buffered in the router till it get a productive port. There can be scenario where you won't get a productive port in the current cycle due to conflict between other packets or due to lack of buffer availability in the next router. So, consider a case, we have a packet that is moving from 12 all the way to 16 by using your x, y routing. So, upstream router should know buffer availability of a downstream router. Let us try to understand what you mean by upstream and downstream. So, 12 is the upstream router and 13 is the downstream router as far as the packet is concerned. Let us say the packet is at 12. 12 should know, upstream router should know the buffer availability of a downstream router. So, before 12 is going to send a packet to 13, 12 should know whether there is a buffer that is available in 13. So, how it has been done? Credit should be exchanged between the router. So, 13 should send some feedback signal back to 12. This feedback mechanism is there between every router to its neighbors because packets can come from any one of its neighbors. So, basically flow control is a process by which an upstream router that is one router will know about whether there is buffer available in the next router or not. So, likewise if the buffer is available, a packet can be forwarded to the next router. If the buffer is not available, then we have to retain this packet and try the same process in the subsequent cycles. Let us try to understand, see consider the case that in 6 the buffer is full. So, buffer full scenario. So, over a period of time buffers will come to 10 and slowly will get accumulated in, in the buffers of 10 and over a period of time 10 will be full. So, 10 is going to communicate back to 14 that uh, buffer is full do not send and this mechanism is totally known as back pressure. So, we know that every router has a set of buffers in its input. The packets will come 
and it will be so residing there you have this buffers that is coming and uh, once you are in the buffer you try to see whether there is a buffer that is available in the next router and based upon that we are uh, going to ensure the smooth flow of packets. So flow control is basically a technique that will help packets to smoothly flow and that is being facilitated by a proper handshaking mechanism between adjacent routers. Now we will try to understand what are the different kinds of flow control mechanisms that is being adopted. Since network on chip concept is inherited from the traditional computer networks, let us try to see can we use the same flow control mechanism that is used in macro networks, so traditional computer networks, can we inherit them in network on chip. So the normal flow control mechanism that is adopted in traditional computer network is store and forward packet based flow control. So what happens is a packet is copied entirely into the network router before it is moving to the next node. So let us say we have a router at S. Now from S you are moving to the next router let us say it is A and B and then only it is going to D. So the entire packet these are all flits of the packets what you see the flits of the packet is getting completely copied to A. And once it reaches A, you perform some error detection and correction. Once the packet is fully received, you move to B. So the same process. That is why it is mentioned that packet is copied entirely into the network router before moving into the next node. So this makes sure that once the packet moves from one router to another, then there is no need to hold for this packet. The next point is this will lead to high per packet latency. So a packet cannot move further until all of the current packet that means flits of this particular packet is getting stored in the current router. This will lead to a scenario such that even if I can move further since my tail has not reached the packets forward progress is blocked. This will surely lead to high per packet latency and moreover we require buffering to the entire packet. Every node should be able to accommodate a full packet because until if the full packet comes I cannot make a forward progress. So in traditional computer networks where buffering is not that a problem, buffering is not cost, is not much a costly kind of an issue, it is no longer practiced so. They basically use store and forward switching. But such a kind of a costly buffering is not possible once it comes to network on chip where in the available chip space that much of buffering is not possible and moreover it is going to incur high latency. So this is how it does if you can see the first packet is going to come and uh, the first flit has come, second flit has come, we can see the third flit is coming and the final flit is coming. Now the entire flit has reached the next router. So based upon that the packet is going to advance to the next one. So advancing from one router to another happens fully in terms of packets, all the flits get copied and then only it is moving to the next destination. So you require a total buffering inside each of the router. Can we do better than this? That is what is the design issue. Another aspect of flow control that has been practiced in macro networks is called virtual cut through switching. It is another form of packet based flow control. So here what we do is start forwarding as soon as the header is received and you have buffers available. So the first flit is going, the head flit is going to reach the next router. We do not wait for the entire flit to reach, meaning the entire packet to reach, that is different flits of the packet to reach. Whenever the head flit can move further forward, the head flit will advance. So you can see that this will dramatically reduce the latency because we are not waiting for the entire packet to reach. Store and forward concept is not there. So let us try to see what happens here. What if the packets are very large? We will see that issue. First fleet is moving. Second fleet will reach. Now you can see that the head fleet has moved on. From here the head fleet has moved on. The tail fleet has not yet reached there. The Second fleet is also moving, so the head fleet. Now if you look at the snapshot, you can see that the fleet is there in many routers. Flits of a single packet is occupying in many routers. 
but this has its own problem that is associated. In worst case, sometimes the head fluid may not be able to move. So, in that case, the tail fluids are going to move further and the buffering requirement is still maximum. So, what to do? If output port for the head fluid, if the output port for the head is blocked. So, the tail will continue, as, but still the head fluid is blocked. So, that will lead to absorbing the whole message in a single switch. So, the advantage of virtual cut through switching is sometimes you could reduce latency. The head fleet can advance as long as buffers and channels is available for him to make a forward progress. So, similarly, every fleet will advance as long as there is a space available in the next router and it gets the resources. But sometimes the head fleet may be blocked but tail fleet can still advance. So, the buffering that you need to keep inside a router is still maximum. There should be buffering for the entire packet. But when compared to store and forward switching, this is going to have little bit of reduction in the latency. But there is no reduction in terms of power and area consumption because still you need to have maximum space permitted for a packet. So, it requires a buffer large enough to hold the largest packet. So, when there is high contention, then the head fleet cannot move, the tail fleet will fully come, then it is kind of a process like store and forward switching. Still, we have to allocate buffers and channels bandwidth for the full packet. Another category that has been typically followed in the network on chip is known as wormhole flow control. So, packets are divided into smaller units called flits that we have seen. Flits are sent across the fabric in a wormhole fashion. So, body fleet follow the head fleet tail follow the body fleet and that happens in pipeline. Even if the head is blocked, the rest of the packet, if the head is blocked, then the rest of the packet is also going to stop. So, what happens is the routing information is available only in the head. Once the head comes, the body fleet and other things will slowly come. Let us try to understand this in a bit deeper. Now, say the head is here and the body fleets are here and the tail fleet is there. So, the fleets of the same packet is scattered across multiple routers. Now, why this is different or what is the main difference between wormhole routing and virtual cut through switching? In the case of virtual cut through switching, the buffering is still maximum. But in the case of wormhole, I can still keep a smaller buffer. It may not be completely able to accommodate the entire packet. So, when the head fleet is not moving, all others are also stopped. A packet's only two flits. For example, consider the case that you have a packet with four flits and the buffering may be only for two flits in a router. So, at any given point of time, a router can accommodate at most two flits of a packet. So, when this is two, it stopped and no other flit can come. Once one of these flit advances, that permits one more flit can come. So, even without having space for the entire packet, Still, I can ensure that movement of flits across multiple routers is streamlined. So, this is the idea of wormhole switching and it is having lower latency, efficient buffer utility because we are not reserving uh, the buffer for the entire packet. And here also we can see that it occupies, a packet occupies resources across multiple routers and the tail flit whenever you get the tail fleet, the tail's duty is to deallocate the resources that is being given. Now, we have seen that store and forward routing has its own problem and a slight improvement was virtual cut through routing and the third one that has been practiced in modern network on chips is the wormhole routing. Now, let us try to understand that another important problem what this wormhole routing is having is called head of line blocking. So, consider the case now you have buffers. Let us say these are the input ports where flits are residing and we have a switching fabric. Consider these are the output ports that you have and we are giving different numbers output port number 1, 2, 3 and 4 different numbers are there. Now, the number that is written, written in each of this flit indicates which output port it wants. So, currently we require this the first flit in input port 1 requires 4 as the output port. So, it is trying to look through 4. 
this requires 2, this requires also 4, this requires 1. What we can see that the fluid that is taking 1 can easily move into. So, this fluid which is looking for 1 will surely get it, this 2 will surely get it. There are 2 candidates for 4, so 1 will get 4. If somebody gets 4, you can see that there is a fleet that is looking for 3. Had this 4 been moving back, this fleet, since it is waiting outside or waiting after 3, it is not going to get. So, we have a scenario where 3 is idle. Flits are there inside this queue which are looking for the third output port and you cannot grant this. And this problem is called head of line blocking. If a head fleet cannot move due to condensation, here you have a scenario where the head fleet cannot move due to condensation, another worm cannot proceed even though the links may be idle. So, here we have a scenario where one of the link is idle, there is a fleet that is looking for that particular link, but because the buffers, the wormhole buffers are in a Q structure, in a FIFO structure, the head fleet cannot advance because of condensation in its desired port. Everybody after the head fleet cannot move. This is called head of line blocking. Let us now try to understand what is head of line blocking. We have seen that wormhole routing is the most commonly used routing technique. Now, wormhole routing has a small problem and that is called head of line blocking. Consider the case that this particular link, what we have at the bottom end, this is now blocked. That means, no more fleets can reach this router. Now, we have two fleets that are traveling from this point S. We have a blue packet consisting of four fleets and we have a red packet consisting of another four fleets. The red packet is looking for this as the destination and the blue is looking for this as the destination. So, these are the two destinations that we are trying to work on. Now, for the time being, since because of the blocking, blue packet cannot reach here, but blue can make some partial progress. Let us see how blue moves. The blue is now slightly getting advanced, the blue fleets reaches here. Now, because of buffer that is full, here the buffer is full. So, further no more blue is allowed to reach this router R. So, blue is stopped by back pressure mechanism, blue is stopped in the previous routers. Let us say Q is the previous router. In the previous router, blue is been temporarily stopped. So, the flits will reach to Q, but all the other flits that is the red flits that is following blue, they are also waiting in the buffers of Q. Now, we have to see that this channel is free, this is a free channel which could have been used by the red, these red flits, but since the red is waiting after blue in the Q, even though the channel is idle, red packets are blocked behind the blue packets. So, blue is in the head of the queue, blue cannot advance, because of that red packets which are waiting after blue is blocked and that is called head of line blocking. So, packets will reach, so red is holding this channel, it remains idle until it has been progress. So, this is the problem of head of line blocking. So, what is the solution for it? We are proposing, this is the basic problem of head of line blocking is being shown there because we have FIFO structures. So, we are going to multiplex multiple channels over one physical channel. So, FIFO buffers are replaced with multi-line buffers, divide up the input buffer into multiple buffer sharing a same physical channel. So, this is called a physical channel, the packets are going to reach like this. Once it reaches a router, rather than having a single FIFO, now, you have different buffers available. You can see that in each of the port, packets can either go to the upper buffer or it can go to the lower buffer. And this concept is known as virtual channels. 
you have a single physical channel a single physical channel is terminating at multiple buffers and these buffers are called virtual channel and the whole idea is called virtual channel flow control so this was our previous structure where each router says this is router r1 this is router r2 so each router is having its own fifo structure and we know that this is going to create head of line blocking the solution is rather than having a single queue structure now we are going to have parallel queues called virtual channels so virtual channels are allocated once at each router to the head fleet and the remaining fleet that is a body fleet and tail fleet are going to inherit the same vc that is why even the head fleet when it moves the other fleets the body fleets and tail fleets how will it know in which way the head fleet has gone that is a process of inheriting a vc head fleet when it reaches once the routing is done it's going to find out which is the neighbor so in that neighbor i have to get a buffer that's called flow control once i get the buffer essentially in this case it's a virtual channel number that virtual channel number is being shared by all the body fleets and tail fleets so even when the head fleet moves advances to the next router the body fleets and tail fleets are going to inherit the same virtual channel number that was used by the head fleet so fleets of different packet can be interleaved on the same physical channel so consider the case that in this case there is a blue one so this blue can travel through this blue may travel through this next cycle the second blue may traveling third cycle it can be an yellow so yellow goes here then it can be a blue then blue will go here then it can be an yellow yellow goes here so we know that these two are by the yellow fleets and the others are basically the red fleets so if you look at a link you can see that both red as well as yellow are traveling in an interleaved manner but we make sure that the green sorry the blue fleets will come and occupy only in this virtual channel and the yellow fleets will occupy only in the corresponding virtual channel so virtual channels also avoid deadlock since you have multiple buffers available i am not waiting for one particular buffer there are a pool of buffers so that will actually break uh the hold and wait condition thereby eliminating deadlock now we will see how virtual channel flow control happens we can see that rather than having a single queue now you have two queues one which is held held by the red fleets the other one which is held by the blue fleets now here as usual our previous problem the blue wanted to reach at this point but it's blocked here so blue will clo reach closer to that so blue is going to be consumed now assume here it is full but blue is held in this router even though now blue is held now you try to see what happens to these packets they will come and reside in the adjacent one and slowly they are moving into the destination so we can see that the red reached destination even though blue is blocked here there is no head of line blocking so by virtue of the parallel tracks called virtual channels that is available even though one of the packet which reached this router early that is a blue packet blue is blocked because i cannot make a forward progress here due to back pressure but the red which was after blue can make forward progress to its destination so we were trying to understand how flow control is happening and this is your tile chip multi core processors in the last two lectures we were trying to see what was routing what is topology and what is flow control and this is how the input side of the routers look like you have buffers in the input and they are known as virtual channels and then there is a crossbar the crossbar is going to connect the input to the corresponding output and this input output is being facilitated by a control logic so we have buffers in the input we have a crossbar that connects the input to the output and we have a control logic that facilitate the smooth flow of packets from the input side to output side so essentially the noc router consists of this many components
Now we will try to understand what are the functions of a router. So the first and foremost function is buffering of a fleet. Whenever a fleet is coming through a channel, the fleet is occupying a buffer. The second task is route computation. For a fleet that is residing inside a buffer, the route computation unit will find out which is going to be the output port that is to be assigned. So the process of finding an output port for an incoming packet is called routing or route computation and route computation is done for the head fleet and the body fleets and tail fleet will follow the same route as been assigned to the head fleet. The third task is called virtual channel allocation. The process of reserving a buffer in the downstream router is called virtual channel allocation. We know that to ensure flow control, it is based upon handshaking between adjacent router. So one router has to tell the adjacent router, I have buffer available, you can send me a packet. So sitting in current router, a packet that already got, I am going through north output port. So contact my north neighbor or get an update from my north neighbor and reserve a buffer in the north neighbor. So I will repeat once again. The process of reserving a buffer in the downstream router is known as virtual channel allocation. Next is called the switch allocation. Whenever I have multiple fleet, let us say I have a fleet here and another fleet here. Let us say these both are going to look for the same output port, let us say south. So when multiple fleets are competing for the same output port, which of the fleet has to be chosen? It is an arbitration process and that is known as switch allocation. And once the arbitration is over, the fleets are going to travel through the switch. So you have switch traversal, so packets will traverse through the switch at any given clock cycle. At most 5 fleets can travel through the switch. One going to east output port, one from west, one from north, one from south and one can to the processing element. So based upon switch allocation, switch traversal takes place and then you have the link traversal. So this many operations happen inside the router and once switch traversal happens, switch is connected to the link. So you have the links here, these are the links and it is called the link traversal. And the router is pipelined. So whatever functions we have seen, buffer write, followed by root computation, followed by virtual channel allocation, switch allocation, switch traversal. This much happens inside the router pipeline and then you have the link traversal. So this is the traditional router that we have seen. So buffer writing is there, five logical stages, then you have root computation, virtual channel allocation, switch allocation and switch traversal that is going to happen. Now, traditionally since it is pipeline, so whenever I am performing root computation for one of the fleet, I can perform buffer writing for other fleet. Similar to the instruction pipeline that we have learnt, here also we could do it in a pipelined manner. So a router may have multiple stages are there. Whenever I am working on a couple of fleets in the switch allocation stage, parallelly the other set of fleets may be in the route computation. Some other set of fleets may be in buffer writing. This shows that we require close to 5 cycles to complete its operation for a packet inside a router. 5 is little, 2 on the higher side. Can we optimize it? Some of these units can be merged together. That is what we are going to see. First we try to understand what is wormhole routing timeline. So buffer writing, route computation and all. So when you look at this point, I am performing route computation for the first fleet at the same time buffer writing for the second fleet. When I am performing virtual channel allocation for the first fleet, I can perform buffer writing for the next one. So when you have head fleets and body fleets, we can see that head fleet has root computation, virtual channel allocation, switch allocation, switch traversal and link traversal. But for body fleets, we won't perform route computation and virtual channel allocation. So it is only buffer writing, switch allocation, switch traversal and link traversal. Second body fleet also follows the same thing. So, route computation and virtual channel allocation is done only for the head fleets. The body fleets and tail fleets will only inherit the route and the virtual channel that is allocated to 
the head fleet. So, root computation is performed per packet only once, virtual channel is allocated only per packet and body fleets and tail fleets inherit this information from the head fleet to make the forward progress. We will try to see what are the dependencies. Now, what do you mean by dependency? I can do a task only after some other task is over. We can see that routing has to be done to perform virtual channel allocation. Only if virtual channel allocation is done, then only I can perform switch arbitration and then only I can travel through the crossbar. So, dependencies between output of one module and the input of another module. So, how are you going to design? You need to have one unit only if the task in that unit is over, then only I can move to the next one. So, this determines the critical path of the router. How much time you need for routing plus how much time you need for virtual channel allocation plus switch allocation plus the crossbar traversal. The whole thing combines together to eat away the time that a packet takes inside a router. Now, we have something called look ahead routing. At current router, we perform the route computation for the next router. So, since we already know I am going to travel to the next router and as per topology, that particular router, after reaching that particular router, what is going to be my next neighbor? Can I perform that? That is called route computation. So, pre-computing a route allow fleet to compete for VCs immediately after buffer write. So, once you reach the adjacent router, buffer writing is been done immediately because I know what is the route because the route is already pre-computed in the previous router. So, my route is north. I wanted to take north. So, virtual channel allocation in the north neighbor will happen. So, routing computation needed at the very next hop can be computed parallel with virtual channel. So, whenever I am allocating virtual channel, I may compute the route and this is the way how it is being done. So, these are the ways by which a 5 cycle initial router was now cut down into 4 cycle. This is the way how you optimize the router pipeline. Let us see one more level of optimization. It is called speculative routing. Virtual channel allocation and switch allocation, speculative switch allocation can happen parallelly. So, routing and decoding stage 1, stage 2 is VC allocation and uh, switch allocation and stage 3 is called crossbar traversal. So, what we do is we will assume that virtual channel allocation stage will be successful. How it is possible? What is virtual channel allocation? The process of reserving a buffer in the downstream router. Yes, if that is success, then I compete with other fleets also who got buffer in the downstream. That is called switch allocation. So, this is happening one after another. We could do some optimization here and that is being done by the process of speculation. Speculation means I assume that virtual channel allocation will happen. If so, I am going to perform the switch allocation. So, the entire virtual channel allocation and switch allocation is done in parallel. So, when the speculation is going to be successful, it is normally valid only under low to moderate load. But there can be cases where virtual channel allocation may not happen. So, in that case, we have to repeat the cycle. So, the whole idea of speculative switch allocation is we assume that virtual channel allocation is be successful. So, I should not wait for that process to get over. With the hope that it will be successful, I perform switch allocation and that is called speculative routing. Now, we will try to learn something about the selection strategies. Consider the case where inside a mesh, you are now currently your focus is on router number 5 and the destination is 10, I could travel through either through 9 or through 6. So, this is a small segment of a 4 by 4 mesh NOC. Your routers are from 0 to 15 and, and I am taking a small segment of it. Let us say there is a packet at 5, wanted to go to 10, it can either travel through 9 or it can travel through 6. So, when there are multiple possible paths for a packet in a router, which one to choose? And that is what is known as selection strategy. So, your adaptive root function sometimes will return, like in this case, it is returning 6 as well as 9. The adaptive routing function will return a set of possible channels and we collect feedback from neighbors. So, congestion feedback is collected from neighbors and based upon that, one of the output is been chosen. This is called output selection strategy. So, input and output selection 
that is the two different mechanisms by which you make a router adaptive. So, adaptivity is the process by which from many I am choosing one. So, I am trying to introduce you to two concepts. The first concept is called input channel selection. Second concept is called output channel selection. Let us try to understand what is input channel selection. Consider the case you have three flits that is shown in green color. Three flits are reaching this router. Let us say you can assume these are north, east, west and south input ports of a router. You are getting three flits. Now all the three wanted to travel through this output port. That is why it has been shown as green color. These three flits wanted to go in that particular direction. So a flit coming from north, east as well as south wanted to go to west at the same cycle. So which one to pick? And that process is called input channel selection. Now we have to see another scenario where a different set of packets are going to come with a different problem that is called output channel selection. So we have one flit that is coming and the peculiarity of this is this flit can be either routed through this output port or it can be routed through this output port. Whenever the destination is having a different row number and column number than the current router, then from the current router it can have sometimes more than one output ports. We have seen that sometimes in west first routing, in north last routing, in odd event routing, in certain routers, certain packets can have more than one output ports. So, when you have one packet with more than possible, more than one possible output ports, which one to choose? That is called output channel selection. So, we will focus something on switch level packet scheduling. It is also known as input channel selection. It is a conceptual view of a router. These are the virtual channels. Let us say you have different applications that we are there and we can see that one virtual channel contains only one color. That means they are flits from the same packet. So, this is the instantaneous snapshot of the input buffer of a router. We have flits of the same packet here that is been shown by the same color. These are all four flits of the same packet, four flits of the same packet, two flits of the same packet. Like that, we can see that the entire channels are the entire virtual channels with respect to one router are full. Now, if you look at the head of all these channels, you have many flits and you have only maximum 5 outputs. So, these many flits are competing for 5 outputs. So, which is the one that you are going to choose and that is what is known as switch scheduling, which packet to choose from among many. It is also known as input channel selection. Switch scheduling plays an important role like which packet will make a forward progress. Some packets may be very critical packets. Some packets may not be critical. Some packets will be very old packets. So, we are using different types of switch scheduling or input channel selection in order to make sure that which of these packets has to move further. So, why the selection strategy is very important. So, what is the source of NOC packets? It is typically cache misses or coherence packets. So, whenever there is a cache miss, Whenever there is a coherence update that has to be given in a tiled chip multi-core system, they are going to create NOC packets. Now, these packets have to be serviced very fast. To service these packets very fast, essentially we have to reduce the latency of those packets. But whenever there is congestion in the network, congestion is going to increase the average packet latency of the packets. So, if you use a good selection strategy that is going to pick the best path, so, a good selection strategy chooses the path with less congestion and a good selection strategy reduce the average packet latency. So, in short, we are going to work on an NOC which has been shared by multiple processors and there are applications that is running on these processors. These applications will work from the L1 cache. Whenever you are not able to get the instruction or data from the L1 cache, it is going to incur an L1 miss and based upon the address mapping that is that we have familiarized in the last lecture, this misses will be triggered as NOC packets to various other cores. These packets are going to travel through the network 
and you have to assume that multiple such packets are going to enter the network from different different nodes which are belonging to different different applications. These packets are going to interfere each other, meet each other, combat each other and contend each other at different different routers. Now the routers when they get packets they have to take a call which one to be prioritized. So working on NOC routers, what are the kind of scheduling or algorithms, what are the kind of adaptivity that you have to bring in, it is very very important. So, how critical is NOC? We have different applications that is running on processors and it is also your net, network on chip is also connected to L2 cache, DRAM controllers and L3 cache if any. So, NOC is a highly critical resource. So, we have now completely covered up the background of network on chip with routing, with topology, flow control and router micro architecture. We have seen how router pipeline works. Now, we will see the big picture in the next couple of lectures, we will see the big picture of how things can be put together in a TCMP architecture, in a multi-core architecture where we will see what is the role that network on chip is going to play in improving the performance of a tiled chip multi-core system. So, with that we complete today's lecture, we are putting some small tutorial exercises also. I request you to familiarize with them so that you get an easy grip over it. Thank you.